Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be presenting to you. My name is Ana Rocha. I'm the executive director for an organization called Nipe Fagio. Nipe Fagio means Pass Me the Broom in Swahili. Uh, we are based in Tanzania, East Africa. And we are currently implementing a zero waste program, a zero waste model, as we call uh, here in Dar es Salaam. Uh, in Tanzania. It's the first of its kind in the region and as far as you know it's also the first of its kind in Africa. Uh, it's a community-based zero waste model, uh, meaning that it's decentralized, it's um, at the neighborhood level and we are hoping that this is going to be a solid waste management system that can actually uh, solve the solid solid um, waste issues that we have, the challenge that we have here in the country. So I'd like to share my screen with you uh, to be able to show you a little bit what we are doing. So yes, as I said, this is a zero waste, um, a community-based zero waste model. Uh, it's being implemented in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Um, the first thing that we do actually before we, we start um, implementing is mapping the areas that are going to work. So here we have an example of a mapping that we have done. Uh, to be able to know where the locations, where the neighborhoods that we are going to work are, and also to be able to understand better what the demographics are, how many households, how many houses, how many people in each one of these neighborhoods, how big they are, how clustered they are. So we do QJS mapping um, to start with. Um, here, a little bit of what I'm going to cover, a little bit about Nipe Fagio, the reality in Dar es Salaam, uh, the project itself, the results that we have had, and some of what um, is coming. So about Nipe Fagio, um, this is actually out of date, to be honest. This is until 2019. These numbers have increased quite a bit, actually, lately. But we are a, a solid waste management organization working with plastic pollution and pollution in general. We have actually done a lot in terms of community engagement, in terms of um, removing waste from the environment, in terms of community action um, and forming groups and everything. Um, a big piece of what we do is actually waste audits and branch audits, what we call that WABA. Um, why do we do that? Because there is very little data about the situation of solid waste um, pollution in Tanzania plastic pollution in Tanzania, like a lot of the solid waste that we find in the environment is actually plastic. And so we basically collect, um, we do cleanups, and then from these cleanups, we do uh, waste audits and branch audits, so we can gather some data, understand what is out there, and then also use this information for advocacy uh, to get the word out there about what is going on. So here you can see from the Plast World Cleanup Day, which was on the 19th of September this year, um, we, we conducted 25 um, cleanups in the country, um, of which 19 had waste and brand audits. Um, and here are some of, the, some of the results. You can see the different kinds of uh, products and materials that have contributed to, to uh, the situation that we have. You can also see a little bit of the brand. So a part of the, the brand audits is really important for us to know, like basically um, who is contributing in terms of producing the waste that is out there. So you can see here some of the brand audits. And you can also see here the producers. The producers are the mother companies, the ones that are actually uh, producing the brands that I just showed in the previous slide. So you can see actually Baresa, which is the one, the first one with 21%, and METL with 17%. These are two local companies, and together they are responsible for about 40% of the waste 
uh, the refined um, in the communities, in the rivers, um, at the beach here um, in Tanzania. So this is just an example of that. We also do waste and branch audits in our zero waste communities. So when we collect the waste from the households, we do waste and branch audits to try to understand um, basically what is being produced, um, what value is in that waste, and also who is producing uh, that waste. So a little bit of the situation in Dar es Salaam. Uh, Dar es Salaam is a very big city and is a fast growing city as well. It's one of the rapidly growing cities. Um, there is an estimation for the World Bank that says that Dar es Salaam grows 1,000 people a day. Uh, so you can imagine how um, difficult it is in terms of um, urban planning. And this is also a situation in Dar es Salaam. You can see here the contrast, like you can see the buildings and then you can see all the informal settlements uh, that are normally built along the rivers or very close to the margins of the rivers. Um, and then when it rains, we have lots of flood issues, as you can see. Here another picture that I can show that and exemplify. Um, in terms of waste generation, um, well, about 70% of Dar es Salaam is unplanned, um, which is obviously a problem. We only have, we don't have any landfill. What we have is a dump site, and that dump site is about 30 kilometers um, away from town, which means that it's expensive to get there and it's difficult to, to get there. Um, these numbers are definitely out of date. So this is from um, 2016, but honestly, I even think, uh, even in 2016, I think we probably had more people than that. I don't think the numbers are the most accurate. Um, but with a population of 5.2 million people, um, we had about uh, 5,600 tons of waste being generated every day. Um, in terms of the infrastructure, which is one of our major problems, um, about 67% of the people have absolutely no alternative for disposal. So when you, when you think about um, asking people not to throw waste in the environment, um, several times it requires you giving them an option because you can't tell someone don't throw waste out there and not give them any option, any better, better option than that, which is a problem. Um, we have the drone mapping of the rivers of Dar es Salaam. I think, as you know, um, most of the waste that actually reaches the ocean comes from the rivers, come, comes from the waterways. Um, we have found along eight, eight rivers of Dar es Salaam over 2,000 waste spots. Um, I think that shows uh, very well the size of the problem. And there is a lot of river dumping here. One, because people don't have a better option. Two, um, there are also communities that are trying to prevent erosion with waste. So um, a way for them to claim land and prevent erosion in their own terms, as they don't have the money to do that properly, is by basically dumping waste at the edge of the river so, um, to hope that the water won't reach their houses. Um, it obviously doesn't work. only works during uh, the dry seasons, but when it's rainy, it's a mess. Um, if you think about Pugu, the dump sites that I told you about, it's very complicated to get there. One, the road is, is not paved all over. Um, so it's difficult when it rains, not every truck can get there. But also you can imagine the high cost to go from one of these red um, areas on this map up to Pugu, uh, especially for the traffic of Dar es Salaam. The traffic of Dar es Salaam is insane. Um, here are some pictures. This is, believe me or not, a river. So Fred, who is a friend, um, he's basically st uh, standing on the edge of the river, at the end of the river. And you can see the situation and see how bad it is. Obviously, when it rains and this water goes everywhere, this waste also goes everywhere. Um, so we have a very, very big problem here with sanitation. Uh, here more pictures. Um, the picture here in the middle uh, that you can see on the top in the middle, that's one picture that exemplifies how people think that waste can somehow 
help them prevent erosion. So those houses on the top are actually almost falling um, off the, the, the reef. And so the way that people do it is that they throw waste there to try to almost build um, a mountain with that waste so that the houses are safe. As you can see, it works during the dry season, but as long as it rains, it just makes, thing, makes things worse, obviously. Um, so yeah, we have waste everywhere, basically. Um, it's a big problem here. So what is our, what are we trying to do? Here is our theory of change, okay? So what we are hoping to achieve is a Tanzania of clean rivers, waterways and oceans as a result of resilient, aware and engaged communities. Um, for us, what we believe is that you cannot achieve um, a clean and healthy environment without having people involved in that. So we need to basically combine those two things and the goal is then a Tanzania of efficient decentralized waste management systems that align social inclusion with environmental sustainability. Um, it's very, very much important to align the social inclusion, especially when you are in a country that is a low income country like Tanzania and where people are just not going to engage on something that somehow is not going to take care of them and their families. And all the work that we do is based on three assumptions that are very important assumptions to, run, to us. One is that when people are given a good choice, they take it. And that's something that I personally believe and we believe as an organization that, as I said before, you need to give people choices and then we give them a good choice, they will take it. Like people are smart. People are going to take uh, choices that benefit them. The assumption number two is that waste can be reduced by 80% through community engagement and government oversight. This assumption, we have, we have um, validated that with other countries that have done similar uh, models and they have been able to reduce waste by 80%. Uh, we believe that you can do the same. And then the assumption number three is that Tanzanian producers will engage in single use reduction if pushed by a policy framework. It's very important that is if push it. So that's why we do the waste audits and brand audits that I showed in the beginning, um, because we hope that that can influence that policy framework uh, to happen. And the way that we do that, we work in three areas, which is knowledge, action, and policy. Knowledge is all the data collection. Um, action is actually implementation, and then policy is trying to change uh, the regulations uh, to make the action um, the status quo, basically, to make the good action um, the status quo. Um, a little bit of how we do it. So basically, the way that our zero waste model works is that we have organized local communities with a, sp a special focus on women, youth, and race speakers uh, into social enterprises, so cooperatives responsible for managing waste in each neighborhood with local government oversight. So basically creating groups that have representation of vulnerable populations and let them lead uh, the waste management at the neighborhood level. And the system needs to be financially self-sustaining and that's, because, that's why we basically try to have as many income streams as we can. So we have created creative and integrated pillars, which are compost production, recycling sales, urban agriculture, uh, chicken seed production, and then collection fees. It's impossible not to have collection fees here because in the low income communities, there is very little value in the waste. So basically we are not generating a lot of waste that we could, for example, sell for recycling. I think you all know also that recycling is a very limited solution <laughs> to waste management. So in a low income country, it's even more limited. Um, and then we also need a transparent financial system to be able to have the communities actually believing in what is going on. Um, and that system needs to deliver an essential and valued service to low income communities. So for the households to contribute financially to this, they need to actually see the value. And so for them to see the value, we need to deliver something that is valuable, that they perceive as valuable. 
So there is a lot of awareness raising education that needs to happen in relation to that. So again, thinking about our zero waste, zero waste pilot project, align social environmental benefits, um, the cooperatives that I just talked about as a form of community organization, uh, recycling in coordination with the Tanzanian Recyclers Association. Um, it needs to be community led, it needs to be adapted to local reality. It can't be expensive, so it needs to be, again, fit the reality that we have. Um, it needs to foster awareness raising and behavior change. And there are many organizations, examples in the global south, uh, willing to support the zero waste initiatives that we have here with knowledge and experience. We have been learning a lot from many, many partners across, uh, across the globe. Um, the objective is to design a community-based zero waste management system. Um, that is adapted to the geographical and socioeconomic conditions of the communities living along the catchment of the missing base food plain. That is actually where we are going to expand um, the project. We are currently implement implementing this um, in three communities already in different areas of Dar es Salaam. And now we are going to expand it hopefully next year to the missing base. Missing base is the main river of Dar es Salaam. Some of the pictures that you saw of the flooding is there. So that's why you are planning to expand it, it there and see if you can help with that, basically. Why does community-based zero waste fit Tanzania? As I said, people plus planet. So it's a solution that aligns social and environmental benefits. This is extremely important. I think everywhere, but even especially um, in low-income countries. It is decentralized. That means that it's less dependent on overwhelmed public services. We don't have the infrastructure. Our government doesn't have um, the capacity or the money or the opportunity to basically uh, take care of everything. So we really need uh, decentralized systems that allow people to be hands-on to solve their own problems. And then it's awareness building. People get to understand that not always is the same. That's extremely important if you think about reducing the waste generation in the long term. That's also extremely important when you think about advocacy. Um, because as I said, 40% of the waste that you find here are produced for, by two main producers. So it's really important for us uh, to be able to push for them to change their delivery systems, change their packaging. And that comes through our business. And then one thing that we always say here is that um, youth unemployment grows really, really high. And the curve is really steep of the growth of the youth unemployment here. And there, I, there is, in my opinion, just one thing that grows as fast as youth unemployment, which is waste generation. And so those two curves need somehow to be combined in a solution and that benefits both the youth um, and the environment. So that's another reason why we do this. Uh, these are some of our results so far. So we have found out, we have actually confirmed because we already knew that, um, but we have confirmed that about 62% of the waste uh, that is generated at the household level is organic. So we can basically compost that, which is really, really cool. Um, there are about 19% of recyclables, but honestly, the, those 19% are not actually recyclable in country. So for us, it's going to be less than that. They are considered recyclable globally, but they don't fit our reality as recyclable. So it's going to be less than that. The residual waste, which is what we cannot do anything with, like it's not recyclable, it's not anything, it's about 15%. And then the hazardous waste, about um, 3%. I think for me, in these initial phases that we had, the most exciting portion of everything, which is based on that first um, assumption that I read to you that when people are given a good choice, they take it, is that the community uh, complied to segregation at source. Um, and in the sample households that we use it, um, that we have reached about 86% of the people uh, complied to the segregation at source. 
which is something that people here used to say that was impossible, that people would never do. But as when people are given a good choice, they take it. Yes, they did comply to that. And that was an extremely um, exciting result. So in terms of future implementation, we are now in the process of organizing the community members into cooperatives. As I said, it's one cooperative for neighborhoods. So we should be honest, we are always doing that because at every neighborhood that we expand, we need to start over uh, creating the cooperatives. We are building the materials recovery facility, which is one also per neighborhood. So we are building some of those right now. Um, we need to build community ownership over the model. So there is a lot of the community engagement happening. Uh, there is a lot of local government engagement as well to ensure that. We run several community educational activities uh, exactly to prompt that engagement that we need. Um, we keep prototyping and, and trying to see as many income streams as possible because we need to generate as much income as we can to make the system self-sustainable, uh, self-sustaining uh, financially. So we basically um, are always prototyping, like we are creative and we keep looking for ways to generate more money. And then the financial model for the system, that's a big, big portion of, of what we are doing of where our brains are. And with that, I think this is uh, my overview of our zero waste model here in Tanzania. Uh, please reach out. I should have actually put our country code, which is 255. Uh, please reach out to me if you have any questions, if you'd like to know more, if you have suggestions, if you'd like to engage, um, you are very welcome. Thank you very much for the opportunity of presenting here. And I hope to see you again soon. Bye.